definitely, definitely a very tough time, not only here in the US, but uh, also around the globe. And we might just want to acknowledge that um, for our black colleagues and uh, with everything that's going on, we hope you know uh, things are going to get better. And we just want to uh, say that we stand in solidarity with uh, black lives and we know that black lives matter. And we just want to let you know that we stand with you and uh, whatever you're going on, uh, going through right now, whatever's going on right now, we know that at the end, you know, we're going to see something good. So again, thank you so much for coming in. We have a, a session, this actually a kickstart session for us, webinar for us. So as you see on the, on the screen, we are decided uh, and uh, Asia and I kind of just putting together this webinar series where we talk about emerging technologies within an archive. So one thing that we think about is that technologies, I mean, advances technologies are affecting everything we do. And we want to see how does it affect our life, like our practices as, as archivists, but also researchers and everybody who's dealing with um, uh, research or dealing with archives. So we have a couple of uh, webinars coming in, but this is the first one and we're focusing on artificial intelligence and archives. And we are so pleased and happy that we have Dr. Antea Seles, who's uh, actually the Secretary General right, of uh, International Council Archives. So she's going to kick off our uh, presentation today. And then one thing we want to let you know is that um, we want to make sure that if you have questions, there's a Q&A tab, please tab in the question in there. If you have a comment that you want to share with the, 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 the whole panelists, we have the chat room, feel free to type in the comments or anything else there. But the Q&A uh, sessions are definitely, uh, the Q&A tab is definitely the place where you want to type in your questions. Something else I, I also wanted to make sure that you understand is that uh, we're gonna have, give time to our presenter to go through her presentation. And then after she's done, then you have time to uh, answer your questions. So with that said, I will hand it over to Dr. Antea. Thank you. Hi, hey, hello everybody. Thank you to Rebecca, Azure, Krista, and Jody uh, and Clear, uh, and to the Mellon Foundation for having me here today to be able to speak on um, archives and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, also, during this difficult time, especially for our colleagues around the world um, who are facing discrimination and oppression, um, ICA stands with you. ICA will support you. So please be assured that we are here um, and we are definitely um, listening to what you to your concerns um, and we're here to support you throughout this uh, what's happening so i'm going to share my screen right now excuse me one second while i get the right piece of information up pardon me here we go okay so Machine. There we go. So, um, like I said, I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence in archives today. This uh, research and the topics I talk, uh, I'm going to be talking about emanate partly from my time when I worked as um, head of digital transfer and digital appraisal and selection at National Archives UK. Um, we did test artificial intelligence software at that time. Um, and then some of this research has also been uh, born out of my own research that I've continued as Secretary General at the International Council on Archives. So just a bit of an overview of what I'll be discussing today. So I'll be touching about uh, on the topic of what is artificial intelligence, the use of artificial intelligence in government, acknowledging artificial intelligence as evidence and as archival record of the future the ethical challenges and the role of the archivist in this space, the impact of information management practice and the implication this has for using artificial intelligence technologies within our own practice, the automating of our archival practice in terms of appraisal selection and sensitivity review, and then I'll also be talk, touching on access and reuse of born digital records, uh, and I would also say digitized records, in the use of research uh, and the automation of that research and researcher expectations. So a few definitions just so that you, in terms that I often use in my presentations, just so that you're aware. So I, when I talk about data, I often distinguish between structured and unstructured data. 
So for me, structured data is about uh, is information that is more often numerical information put in tabular form to enable qual uh, quantitative analysis. So this is things that you would find in, say, an Excel document. Um, unstructured data is information consisting of word processing documents, PowerPoint presentations, videos, sound recordings, and photographs. Um, I also talk about structured and unstructured record keeping environments. So when I talk about uh, unstructured or pardon me, structured record keeping environments, these are environments where records and, or documents and data are placed in an ordered fashion to allow for retrieval. So this can include information uh, management systems or shared drives with a unified classification scheme. So I also talk about non-structured record keeping environments and these are environments where documents and information are not organized and can be comprised of running sequence of, of documents, shared drives with no unified classification, uh, classification scheme, or any type of information management system where the information is organized in an ad hoc fashion or in an unstructured fashion. So what is artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence can be defined in many different ways. There's actually, from my research, I can find no standard definition about what AI means. Everybody's got a different mind map, chart, uh, understanding of what artificial intelligence means. There are two categories that I often talk about when I talk about AI, which is supervised and unsupervised. So when I talk about supervised, it requires a human to mark up or compile a homogeneous data set to train an algorithm to recognize patterns or terms in the data. Uh, and this process requires a lot of upfront work and also requires you to have some level of understanding of the data set. Um, I'll try and unpack this a bit when I talk about how we try to apply artificial intelligence technologies when we were trying to automate the appraisal and the selection process at National Archives UK and what this means if you try and do this in practice in an archival institution. Second is unsupervised. So the data is loaded into the system without any upfront, at least by the user, any upfront human intervention and analyzes the data and provides a result. So I caveat the use of unsupervised because whilst you're putting the information in the system and you're getting an output at the end of it, the algorithm itself has been trained with a specific set of data for a specific reason or to analyze data in a particular way. So whilst unsupervised, there's still an element of training that has happened in the back end. And as an archivist or as a records manager, or information manager, you need to think about this because it influences the output that you're going to get, even though you're not necessarily directly telling the machine from the outset what to do. So these are considerations when we talk about supervised and unsupervised. Um, and, and so to help you kind of distinguish around how much work you have to do up front, but also what are the considerations you need to think about when you're starting to engage with artificial intelligence in its different forms, because artificial intelligence is really an overarching term. So like I just said, artificial intelligence is really an all encompassing definition for any activity where a machine or system takes information structured or unstructured to predict an outcome. Machine learning is a process of training a system to learn how to make a decision using a pre tagged data set. This is my definition and it may not align to other definitions that are out there. So I in full uh, open openness on that. Neural networks are just like uh, how we use our brain to identify patterns and classify information. And neural networks can be uh, trained to, uh, to accomplish certain tasks to a degree. They will never replicate the, ca the capabilities of the human brain, but they do allow us to parse through large heterogeneous sets of data to arrive at a conclusion. It's not always clear sometimes when you use neural networks and particularly deep neural networks. So neural networks that are layered one on top of the other, how a machine sometimes arrives at its decision. A classic neural network that we are all now familiar with is something like um, facial, uh, facial recognition, face recognition, recognition, sorry. So that's a, a type of neural network that neural networks also, uh, in that neural network you'll have, it identifies to begin with skin color. Um, it identifies then positioning of the eyes or mouth or ears. It just identifies hair color. And then all the different networks speak to each other and compare the input to the output so they can say this is the same person or it looks to be the same person with a degree of accuracy. So that's a, a type of neural network. 
So just so that you can see the nesting uh, of the terms, uh, it's again, it's it, this is just to give you an idea. It's, it's not 100% accurate, but artificial intelligence really is the overarching term. You have machine learning as a subset to that, and then deep learning or neural networks. So I'm gonna be dividing this presentation into three different sections. So I'm going to be talking about the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning and data mining in government. Um, and governments around the world are already using artificial intelligence and machine learning to make policy decisions, to create policy visualizations for, uh, in order to make decisions at a very high level. It brings with it certain challenges and, and certain uh, risks. Um, which as archivists who advise on the creation of records, we need to be aware of because we're often brought in an, an advisory capacity. Um, and we need to be aware, I think, of some of the ethical issues that come into play when governments are trying to use artificial intelligence um, in, in policy. Now, the issue becomes, you know, does this blur the role of the archivist to some degree? What is the impact on archivists and on the profession? Um, I think we also have to unpack the whole issue of are we actually invited to this table to have that discussion though with decision makers. There's a whole host of issues that I'm going to try and unpack today. I'm also going to touch on the use of artificial intelligence in archival processes. So here I'm going to be pulling a lot on my work um, at, at the National Archives UK. Um, I'm, what we tested at National Archives UK was off-the-shelf commercial artificial intelligence software which is very limited in its capacity and what it can do. But what I'm gonna try and, and convey to you are things to think about if you're going to try and use this, te this type of technology um, in your own processes, uh, in your own analytics, uh, because there's just too much information now for us as archivists to be able to look at when we look at born digital and digitized material. Um, and so I'll try and give you some ideas of uh, things to consider, questions to ask, how to engage with commercial providers in this space. Um, and then I'm going to talk about making records accessible and readable for research, um, particularly for automated research that may be using uh, artificial intelligent uh, software or technology. There are some considerations as archivists that we need to think about. Um, although we want to be open and transparent and make our information available in as much as possible, there's a big question for us about what happens when we break down the silos that we have created using our descriptive practices and what this means by breaking it down and what this potential what implications and risks we may be exposing ourselves to so i'm going to start off now by talking about the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning and data mining in government so as i said decisions are being made now using machine learning and artificial intelligence these techniques are being used by data scientists or statistical analysis units in government departments, as well as private corporations. So the reason I juxtapose these two government and private corporations is because increasingly in government, there, is, there are more public private partnerships and AI is definitely no different in this regard. We just need to look at, even if we take it outside of archives and artificial intelligence, if we look at the recent SpaceX initiative, which was a government, NASA government department working with private corporations to uh, boost, reinforce the U.S. space program again. This is increasingly the approach that a lot of governments are taking. I understand governments are under the cosh. I understand that they don't have a lot of resource to give. Um, and they're increasingly outsourcing a lot of things. They're, they're outsourcing IT infrastructures. They're outsourcing this type of work with artificial intelligence. But what this does is that this really poses, I think, from an ethical standpoint, as an archivist watching this, around transparency and accountability. Government has its own structures, uh, internal and external via access to information law, uh, protection of privacy law, that enables us as citizens to hold them to account. When we get private corporations in the mix here, which is increasingly happening around visual, uh, policy visualization and data analysis work, because governments don't necessarily have that capacity or training or ne don't necessarily want to put that resource into this process, it creates a whole nother kettle of fish that we that needs to be unpacked as citizens, as archivists that we need to be aware of, because uh, the, these corporations are not as 
uh, incumbent under the law to be accountable for what is happening. We only need to look at things like Cambridge Analytica and the impact that this had both on the US elections and on the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom and what happens. The only reason we realized that this had happened was because there was a, a leak internally um, from Cambridge Analytica and they went to the press. And there isn't that level of capability as citizens for us to hold these private corporations to account. So it's something to think about when we talk about AI in government decision, uh, decision making. So coming back to the slide, so uh, data science and the ability to mine data is seen as a competitive advantage. So a lot of corporations are starting to use this. Platforms, of course, that we commonly use, so Netflix, Google, and Facebook all use some type of artificial intelligence or predictive technologies, whether that's to give us ads or suggest, uh, suggest movies to us. For governments, it's a seen as a way to parse through large volumes of data, both structured and unstructured, to make a decision. So there are huge amounts of data sets, huge amounts of documents that are sitting uh, in different information management systems, in shared drives, in, in social media that, um, that governments need to mine and private corporations need to mine in order to, to do their work and also to make decisions. But it brings with it, I think, some challenges that we as archivists need to be, need to be aware of across the piece. So there are challenges with the data science approach and the use of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in government uh, decision making. So one of the big things I saw when I was working in the UK, and I've seen it elsewhere, is are, is the data that we're meant to be combining, is it supposed to be combined together? There was a big push for a long time, uh, at least in the, when I started working at the international level, around open data. And that was really tied with the open government partnership. And the view was we just need to get data out, of it, out there and we need to just uh, make sure that people have access to it and it's published. That's fine. But one of the pieces of feedback over time that came to researchers, that uh, colleagues at University College London, who wrote about you know, open data, open government, and the integrity of the data set is that people who were trying to use the data or researchers that were trying to use the data had no ability to understand how was the data compiled? Who was the sample set? So in terms of, you know, what was the data compiled for? Was it for, I don't know, cancer research or was it for uh, monitoring infrastructure? And so how, what then is the sample set in order for you to start working uh, in analyzing that data? How was that data compiled? Who did they talk to? There's a whole host of things that were not necessarily published. But there are equally within government, uh, it, so coming back to that, it's difficult then to combine. If you don't know what the, the basic uh, infrastructure for creating that data is, how do you then know whether you should combine it with another piece of data? Because you could be comparing apples and oranges and then just saying, I've made a decision, I've, I've analyzed this data and there's a decision, but it could be completely inaccurate and an erroneous decision. Um, and also by not having that background information, you don't necessarily, you aren't necessarily able to understand is the data biased? Uh, is the data skewing the results to a specific outcome? Um, I, know, I know when I worked in government and elsewhere as well, there was this view by data scientists, well, if you just send us the, the data, we can just combine it, it'll be fine. And that doesn't mean to say that um, that's the approach of all data scientists or all statisticians. There are, I, what I saw when I worked in government was there were different levels of rigor around uh, tracking, uh, well, uh, tracking how data was combined, what pieces of information may be taken out of the data set, because pieces of information that are taken out can have a huge impact on the outcome. Or if you change something from centimeters to meters, again, it has a, an, an impact on the output that you're gonna get. So, um, but there, there was an approach in some of the departments where they were saying, well, we can combine a data set from the Department of Education with the Department of Transport to arrive at this conclusion. I was like, well, wait a second. What were the original data sets compiled for? What is the question that you are asking that you are seeking to answer? And that's often, I think, key when you're going to talk to any data scientists or any decision makers or anybody who's doing this work in government is, what is the question you are trying to answer? And does this data help you towards that? Simply because it kind of sort of looks like it's, it should be the right data does not necessarily mean that it should be combined. 
Um, and when you are combining it, and let's say it is data that you can put together in order to make a decision or make a policy visualization, then sometimes you take information out or you have to change uh, different variables. Well, that has to be documented because again, it has an impact on the output. And as archivists, we need to be able to track all of this. We need to capture all of this. And this needs to be because from accountability perspective, if it isn't tracked, if we don't have that information, then how does a decision maker or how does somebody who is involved in data interrogation and then has to present before you know a public select committee or has to present before uh, a parliament how do they how do they explain that how do they explain the impact of the decisions if those decisions no longer exist and so as archivists we have to capture that trail and that's a huge trail and i'm not saying at all that that's um, a small amount of information we need to capture, but that has to be tracked. And we also need to make sure that these individuals that are involved in this type of work and that are, give, and are feeding this information, whether it's in a, a policy visualization or el uh, else something else, that we are able uh, to, to, to make sure that that is all being captured, that is all being documented. So that when the, if the decision ever comes to the fore, if that becomes questioned, then they have the process there to be able to be held to account. I think a big thing when we talk about artificial intelligence is, is the data biased? And how does that uh, impact the output of the algorithm? And how does that impact the effect of what we see and how we interpret it? Sometimes, you know, there isn't, when I was speaking or working in government, sometimes that wasn't always the consideration. Um, and that, or that wasn't necessarily always front of mind. Again, it depended on which department you spoke to. Um, and so sometimes it was, and, and sometimes it wasn't. But it is something definitely that you have to think of because you have to think about it in terms of if you're gonna put uh, information that's gonna skew in one direction, well, how do you compensate for that skew? How do you make sure that what the output you're getting has precision and recall? Um, and in, in terms of the question that you're asking as well. So it's all about, you know, what's the starting point? What is it you're trying to, to address? What is the question that they're trying to address? Um, and then, then looking at then if the data is skewing in a certain direction, but you have to have all the contextual information about the data, uh, then how do you then compensate for that? I think archivists have often played a role in advising organizations on the creation and preservation of records and data to ensure their evidentiary value. But my question to the community would be what advice would we give in the creation and preservation of algorithmic and computational records. Now I use the term algorithmic and computational uh, with, uh, for a reason. These are not types of records we, I feel, as a community have ever had to deal with before. These are records that um, we can never read. It's not like a piece of paper like I have in front of me now or a notebook where I can, as a human, I can read the, the, the words that are on the page or I can see the numbers on the page. This is, is something completely different. And the only way we can test an algorithm and test its output is by giving it data. Um, and so there's, there's an intangibility around these records. And I'm not sure that we, we would be able to properly advise on the creation and preservation. I think there's the whole host of work as a community that we need to do here. So uh, does the archivist play a role in advising and how algorithms and code are created for decision making and how do we know what to preserve? I absolutely think we have a role here. I think we have a role as the advisor. Um, and I think that we need to look at though what it is that we need to create and preserve. So to give you an idea of how a policy visualization is created in government, and this is just an example. So oftentimes there's information in Word documents or in structured information, which is then sometimes put in tabular form or combined with other data. So this whole process here, uh, this needs to be documented. So if we're extracting information or we're using an algorithm to in pull out information, to be able to combine with this data set here or to put it in tabular form, that all needs to be documented. Any of the tabular data that we have chosen to put into or to use as part of the interrogation process, that all has to be documented. There has to be justification why this information is present whether information has been taken out or put into these tabular sets of data in order to arrive at the endpoint. And again, the, the, the question that you are asking the machine to answer is absolutely important. And understanding how that algorithm then outputs the decision, understanding precision and recall, 
is absolutely essential or else you are going to have a very difficult time assessing whether the output is accurate and potentially could be creating policy visualizations or making decisions on inaccurate information or information that is skewed or biased. So you have to be really careful throughout this process and understand what is your output. Algorithms can own, are not cannot do multivariable assessment. What I mean by that is it can only look at the variables that you put into the machine and, and, and how it interprets it and, and outputs it. It cannot take contextual information like um, what a person, let's say you're looking at cancer. It's not what it's going to look at or whatever the variables are that you are analyzing. It's not going to be able to assess somebody's mood, somebody's socioeconomic background, all of these types of things that are contextual pieces of information that are important as part of the research project process, but the algorithm is not going to be able to do that. This is not a silver bullet to answer all of our questions, and it's not going to guess uh, or come up with decisions on the fly. We need to be cognizant of the limitations of these tools, and, but we also need to ensure that this process is documented. Other things that often end up in machine learning and policy visualizations are things like Twitter uh, or social media, uh, uh, social media outputs. And it's often used uh, on the commercial, uh, in the private sector, in the commercial side to build, uh, to build advertising campaigns. And I've been to conferences where they've talked about successful advertising campaigns that have been solely built uh, just using uh, Twitter or social media data. But that said, in a policy visualization, it is what like how was the how was the data scraped from twitter um sometimes it, if depending on the type of question you ask and there was research a few years ago if you ask the question slightly differently you can sometimes get a completely different output in your twitter scrapes so this becomes important when you're doing this type of work to be really precise and really document what is the question that you ask and what was your return then there's all the code that then goes into this so you put this in and then you have to develop the code to then come up with this type of a policy visualization. Now, when you this is just an example, uh, and this is actually a screenshot from uh, the appellate court in France uh, on uh, compensations in divorce proceedings. But uh, what I'm trying to say here is that these, if this was a policy visualization, potentially we could be saying, where am I going to allocate money in the French judiciary system to be because we have a certain number of divorce cases in this area and this is where it needs support. But if I've missed out a whole segment of data or the data is biased, I could potentially be leaving out an entire segment of the population from having some type of support or from getting funding. So this is where the importance of knowing the question and having accurate data and knowing the bias in your data becomes really important because then there are decisions that impact people's lives. So another use of artificial intelligence in um, that I saw, at least in the news, uh, in government decision making is handwriting to help governments. In this case, it was from three years ago. It was in Sky News, which is a British or UK uh, news organization. And they were talking about handwriting analysis to help, help government catch gangs behind mass scale fraud, benefits fraud. So there's some ethical considerations here uh, from, a, uh, from different points of view. So there's potentially the archival record. How do we capture this? How do we capture the training data? How do we capture the decisions that are made? But if this becomes, there's ethical issues of archivists that we need to think about. So here are some of the issues I'm gonna, I'm gonna raise here. So if this becomes standard practice in government and it passes, it passes into policy, how do we begin to advise firstly on what documentation needs to exist to document the training data and then subsequent information that is needed uh, that is input or not into the system. So what does integrity and accountability look like in this context and also what do we preserve and what is the role, ethical role of the archivist here? So here, here are some, some issues I'm going to flag. So handwriting analysis is not a precise science. There are, there are massive projects that are out there. Transcribus is one of them. Um, but it is, it is a very difficult uh, type of uh, machine learning because handwriting varies. Handwriting varies over your lifetime. Handwriting varies according to the different individual that is writing. The su most successful projects I have seen around handwriting analysis have had are, are laboratory or experimental, I would say, mostly based in research institutions and mostly with very finite uh, set of data. What uh, the issue here I have with this particular, uh, if uh, in this particular initiative is that, so what government potentially is doing here is testing 
what I consider a nascent software, nascent uh, algorithms that are really untested and inaccurate. So what we are doing here is we're testing potentially inaccurate uh, or sort of still in experimentation algorithms to catch uh, to essentially on some of our most vulnerable in society. You know, when I look at people who claim benefits, you know, these are, these are often people that have legitimate claims. And when you look at, and I'm not saying that benefits, uh, benefit fraud doesn't happen. It does happen. But when I look at the cost benefit analysis here of how much am I actually saving by targeting an experimental algorithm at the most vulnerable people in society, when I know that from a tax perspective, there are probably, you're probably going to make more money from tax evasion than you will from this. I have a serious issue from an ethical perspective, but also as an archivist, if I was advising on this, I would be saying, I recommend you do not do this and would be laying out the reasons why, because, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an issue here I have as an archivist and as an individual around essentially experimenting on the most vulnerable in society uh, in order to, in order to get decisions from an algorithm to purportedly save money. So this has some serious considerations. I think there, uh, you know, I say this, but I think we need to be careful as archivists, you know, how do we balance that ethical role that we, that as individuals, as, as human beings, we, we play, but also within our profession. Um, ostensibly, you know, I have had situations where government departments have gone and done their own thing. My, my fallback position at that point as an archivist is, that's fine. I've told you, I've advised you, but what I'm going to now do is I'm going to document and I'm going to make sure that every extant decision that you have and you've made, whether that's training the algorithm, because training an algorithm is an iterative process, I'm going to capture all of that and I'm going to make sure it's preserved. And there will come a time when you will be held to account for that decision. So um, it's something that as archivists we need to think about, um, but it is, you know, in terms of usage of uh, AI, there is in, in government decision making, there is definitely this push and I saw it again and when I was working in government that somehow artificial intelligence will solve all of our problems, will make our lives easier uh, and is a panacea uh, to, to uh, in decision making, which it absolutely is not. It is only a tool and the tool is only as good as the data that you can put in it and is only as good as you train it. But like I said, it cannot do multivariable assessment. Uh, it can't assess a whole set of different variables that may also sit outside of the machine itself that need to be taken into account. Another one that um, I'm sure many of you are aware of uh, is the machine learning artificial intelligence in recidivism rates. So this is documented not only in uh, Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Math Destruction, but it's documented uh, in, in uh, research uh, papers. Uh, so in some of the U.S. states, they were using algorithms to determine recidivism rates. So it was called COMPASS, the Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions. So some of the context for the data that was used to train COMPASS, the algorithm created by North Point. So this was a private organization. So the sentence is given to African-American prisoners in the federal prison is 20% longer than those given to white convicts for similar crimes. African Americans represent 13% of the population of the US uh, of the United States but only account for 40% of the, and but account sorry for the 40% of the prison population. So what the issue here was the base uh, training data set was biased. And then the company used the algorithm to, uh, and marketed it then to uh, uh, courts and judiciaries in, in various states in the United States as a way of uh, calculating recidivism rates. So the, uh, the propensity or the percentage that uh, an individual is more likely to reoffend. The problem was one, so not only was the data bias because they essentially were using questionnaires uh, that had been compiled one in the 1990s. Then they were asking questions in and then what impacted as well was that policing, uh, uh, one of the questions was, do you know an offender? Or have you ever been uh, con convicted or stopped by the police? And the problem was a lot of these of the people that were being targeted by the recidivism algorithm by saying they will reoffend. It was that these were individuals who were in low socioeconomic uh, neighborhoods. The police and the way that the police were, were monitoring those neighborhoods was much bigger and for much smaller offenses, though. So for, uh, you know, misdemeanor, uh, misdemeanor drug offenses versus targeting people for murder. 
So the way that they were policing meant that these individuals that ended up getting marked as high recidivism rate in the training data set were already disproportionately disfavored by the policing system, which then reflected itself in the questionnaire, which then made it into the data set that trained the machine. So this, is a, this was a huge issue. Then secondary point is that North Point, because it was a private corporation, there has no accountability there. So, you know, they, it, it came after the fact. And they were actually had a closed, what I call the closed algorithm, which is they weren't retraining the algorithm. So they weren't compensating for the bias. So the bias just kept presenting itself, presenting itself, presenting itself, which is a huge issue. Um, and so, and it's something we need to be mindful of when we're using uh, algorithms in government decision making and for policy decisions. So why should this matter to you? Why should this matter to archivists? Algorithms are the historical documents of tomorrow and now. Governments need to be held to account if they use these technologies to make decisions that have an impact on people's lives and of that of their citizens. And we are responsible for identifying and preserving that information. It comes back though to some questions. Uh, what, should we, but what should we be preserving? Because this is a huge amount of information. This isn't just a piece of code. It's the, are we preserving all the components that contributed to the training of the algorithm? So that includes like all the documents, the data, the social media information, uh, the tracking of decisions around what was kept, what was left out, what was put in, what was you know in the in the tabular data, what potentially was taken out, how they're the iterations of the code. Because you're in when you're doing uh, when you're doing this type of work, it's also and especially if you're the one working on the code, it's how do you keep how what do you need to how are you retraining that algorithm with different pieces of data in order to get the outcome, and so uh, when we are archivists, do we only get the final algorithm? Do should we get all the different iterations of the algorithm? Uh, should we get the iterations of the result? So uh, or do we just get the algorithm and the results? So there's huge questions about this, but these are not small pieces of data. Like this isn't like a little bit of, this isn't like two megs or something. This is like terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data. And if you're looking at the propensity of use in government of artificial intelligence to make policy visualizations or to make decisions using these machines, the issue is, you know, how, which ones do I target? What, what's the appraisal and selection process here? Is it only the ones that impact citizens' lives? Which ones do we choose and how do we preserve it? Because our, most archives don't have data centers. And so what does this mean for us? What partnerships perhaps do we need to consider? Um, or do we just keep certain components of the, of the process and then have pointers that will say, well, this information is kept here if you want the source training data. Or if you want this other piece of information, you have to go here. So there are huge questions that we still need to ask ourselves about how we're going to preserve this. But we need to ask it now. Like these are records and these are things that are being used in government, in private corporations now to make decisions. And we need to develop a strategy in order to be able to do this. So, like, and so all of this requires us to have the capacity and the skills to advise decision makers in departments and ministries that are seeking to implement these technologies. The problem is, are we invited to the table? I would say no, we are not invited to the table. And so there's always the question, well, how do we then get invited to the table? I think that for me, uh, I just invade myself in when I was working in UK government. I just presented myself and knocked on the door and knocked on the door and knocked on the door until they let me into the meeting. Not everybody is like that. Um, but I think we, it, it's about starting that conversation and it's about sort of slowly incrementally building the case to make sure that we show up at that table. Um, it's not easy. It takes years of work. Um, but once you're there, then then at least then you're sitting there, you're listening, and you can contribute and ensure that the information that is being captured is accurate. It's also trying to find your allies in here. So finding people who are sympathetic to ensuring that, you know, information is properly documented, that the training data is, is uh, as, as representative and non-biased as possible. You know, there's a whole host of issues, a whole host of uh, allies that we can find out there to help us either get the message across or also get invited to the table. So I'm going to talk now a bit about the use of artificial intelligence processes in archival work. Oh, sorry. I'm, so coming back to the previous point, my apologies, I forgot to flip the slide a bit further down. 
So what are the challenges when we talk about um, artificial intelligence and in government? Um, and the challenges and issues for us. Well, the challenges and issues are, us, are that we will be responsible for preserving these algorithms in the intermediate and historical archives. Um, and so it means, it comes back to the question I said before, how do we identify them? And then how do we capture them? I, I wouldn't even know where to begin in terms of um, how do we export, like do we leave it in the government department system? Do we export it? Where do we export it to? Uh, if we don't have the data centers or the capacity or infrastructure at the archives, do we have to create some type of a cloud environment? What are the security risks with this? Like, again, there's a whole host of issues that we need to unpack here. Um, as I said earlier, we are not currently considered stakeholders when it comes to discussions connected to the development and implementation of AI technologies. So that's definitely something that as a, as a profession, like I said, it's about finding who your allies are. You know, is that statisticians? Is that data scientists? Is that decision makers? <clears throat> is that people working in IT? Um, or, you know, there's more and more artificial intelligence sort of departments or bureaus in different governments uh, or in different private organizations or institutions. So it's how do we sort of, how do we build those relationships with them to ensure that, you know, our concerns, our messages and our needs, because these, like I said, these are records, are, are captured and properly captured and documented. Um, I would say, however, that we don't currently have the skills or capacity to play our role as a trusted advisor on information management questions related to AI records to ensure their preservation and durability. I don't think this is insurmountable. Um, you know, I say it, but I think it's because, um, you know, there are skills out there that, that we can easily acquire. You know, I took an introductory course to, to statistics on Coursera, and that helped me immensely understand issues around, you know, uh, plot, uh, box, uh, box plotting, how that impacts in terms of understanding variability in the data, understanding skewing of the data. Um, so these are, I mean, these, are, these are generally accessible courses. They're not huge amounts of money. And it's sort of incrementally building your knowledge about how these technologies work. You don't have to be an expert. So I want to be clear, you don't have to be an expert, but it's understanding how they work so that you can begin to advise on ensuring that the proper documentation is there in order to ensure that what the archives then preserves is the, the totality or the, the comp as, as complete as possible a record. We need uh, not only to advise decision makers on the preservation of algorithms, but we need to understand how to manage significant ethical challenges that would be posed by AI technologies. So AI technologies are, are used across governments, uh, across the piece. And oftentimes they are used to impact citizens and they have an impact on citizens' lives. Um, and there are gonna be times where we are gonna be walking into situations where we may have serious ethical issues as individuals, as, as archivists, um, about what is happening. And I think that there is a lot of discussion that we still need to have about how we're gonna handle this. I don't necessarily feel that all of our code of ethics are up to date. I hold my hand up. I see a code of ethics is not up to date um, and definitely needs to be updated. Uh, but, you know, I think we need to unpack what, what these technologies mean for us in terms of our practice, as well as how do we advise and government and decision makers and, you know, even the institutions and corporations that we represent how to use these technologies um, and, and also how to properly document the decisions that they're arriving at. It is sometimes difficult to understand how an algorithm arrives at a result or a decision, even if we preserve everything related to that decision. So I think we need to accept the uncertainty that uh, the uncertainty principle is what I call it in algorithms. We could document it as well as we possibly could, and we could still not always understand how it arrives at a decision. So I'll give you an example. So I was reading in Scientific American, uh, I think it was from about a year ago, year and a half ago, an article about some scientists who were training robots. The base data was the same. They exposed the robots to the same conditions and, and it was around uh, early childhood language acquisition and, uh, and, and early childhood learning. And one robot was adapting well, uh, had, was able to, to output you know, a basic set of words and the other one kind of almost shut down and they couldn't figure out why. 
Uh, and these are very advanced, you know, machine learning algorithms that are in these types of, in, that are used in robotics, but they couldn't understand why in one situation, both training data was the same, both exposed to the same situation and why the two robots reacted differently. So there is an uncertainty principle that we will need to accept. How lawmakers and others accept that, I'm not sure what, what that will look like. But as archivists, it's about preserving and maintaining as complete a record as possible. So impact of information management practices. So now I'm getting into the discussion about archival processes um, and how we use uh, algorithms in our own archival processes. So why am I talking about information practices? Well, actually the information practices have a huge impact in our ability and, uh, in how, and also how we use AI in our own work. So information management systems, at least from my experience, are not always easy to use and they can be quite rigid which means that users will often try and find other and easier ways to file their information. And believe me, I saw this a lot when I worked in government. So what, what I often saw was that uh, government departments would implement an information management system and then leave the shared drives open at the same time. But sometimes the rule around, rules around the information management system were so rigid, so strict, that people just would not use the information management system or would use it uh, and would revert back to shared drive, which, and sometimes what ended up happening is that we would have two uh, types of record keeping systems running at the same time, resulting in incomplete folders and duplication. Uh, in the UK, we carried out a study to assess the state of record keeping government departments and understand the amount of legacy data they had. So when I talk about legacy data, I'm talking about data that is no longer necessarily actively used in government departments, but it's just sitting there. Sometimes they've offlined it. Sometimes it's just shit, it's sitting in a shared drive somewhere. Um, and there was, what we found was actually quite interesting. So for every terabyte of data in an information management system, there was about 25 terabytes in shared drives. And this did not include data or information held in email servers. When we accounted for he uh, email servers and data, because we also had a huge argument with our departments about, well, they didn't feel that data felt was a record. They thought data was separate, that, that it, was, it was, because what they thought was a record was, uh, you know, unstructured data. So PowerPoints, presentations, Word documents, audiovisual, but data, no, that's not a record. That doesn't need to go to you, which we had to have a discussion. Yes, yes, it does. If you're using it to make a decision, then yes, it is part of the record. So once we accounted for the totality of information holdings, which included email servers and data sets, it added up to about 1.5 petabytes of data that needed to be appraised and selected. Now for the IT people out there that you're like, ah, 1.5 petabytes it's not a big deal when you an archivist look at looks at that it's about 1.5 billion word documents there is no way that any archivist can look at 1.5 billion word documents so information management teams often didn't know what was contained in legacy data holdings and did not know what documents or data needed to be preserved so we're coming into a situation potentially where we've got 1.5 billion word documents the information manager and this is legacy old data that's been archived, I don't know, for sometimes only five years, still don't know what's in it. So they're asking us to help them because in the United Kingdom, the appraisal and selection, so what, what to keep and what to throw away was done before it could be transferred to National Archives. So the, the departments were like, I have no idea what's in here and I don't know how to go through this uh, and, and figure out what to keep and what to throw away. Because if, you, if I go back, we've got two filing systems that exist at the same time. So you had the information management system and the shared drive. Sometimes the shared drive was in such wonderful shape that you just had a running sequence of records and you had such helpful titles as my doc, MISC, Bob's files. So how do you do appraisal and selection in this type of environment? Um, and especially if the teams didn't actually know what was in the, the holdings themselves. The information could also have varying levels of contextual information and limited metadata, and the metadata could also be compri compromised, pardon me, because of previous migrations. So this was a massive issue for us when we were trying to apply the commercial off-the-shelf software technologies that I was talking about earlier. Because oftentimes our, our um, I'm thinking in French now, our point de repère, um, our, our points of reference within the records are the date. But the problem is, 
is that sometimes we had three different dates. So we had the date of modification, the, a date that was actually written in the record itself. So when I opened the Word document, the date in the, the, the document, and then the date in the, in the actual file title. And I'm like, which date? Is the accurate date. Sometimes they would be a year out from each other, sometimes, you know, maybe a few days, sometimes years apart. Um, and what ended up, we ended up finding out from some of our departments. So, for example, in the UK, we had a 20 year transfer rule. So, after 20 years, departments had to technically transfer their data to us. We had a department come to us and we knew that they had information from like 1995. And we're like, so where is this information you have from 1995? I'm like, oh, no, no, we don't have anything. It's 2000. Don't worry about it. You know, we've got another five years before we've transferred. I'm like, but wait, you told us in a survey you filled out that you had stuff from 95. So where is it? And then they start going through their, their sort of records and they start looking at when they implemented their first information management system. And we had actually planned to run a piece of artificial intelligence uh, off the shelf software that we were testing. And we, we had them run it. And then they came back and said, well, everything, there's a huge spike in, 19, in 2000 because we were analyzing the dates. And then they said, oh yeah, that was the year we, we implemented our new information management system. And I guess all the dates from 1995 migrated over into the date of migration. And I said, well, then you technically have information from 1995. And so where is it? Because there's also everything to do with sensitivity review. So if information, we had to determine whether information was open or closed, and that all had to be done before transfer to National Archives. So it created a huge issue for us in terms of determining, you know, when information was, was to be transferred, when information needed to be opened or closed. Also, we had issues because if we were trying to identify material from, for a particular historical event, so because they didn't know what was in the data, what we often asked them to do was go you know, have a conversation either with people that used to work here or go do some research about what the department major sort of events in the department were at a given point in time to help you start to see if you could use the machine, train the machine to pull up certain pieces of information. But if you're there doing a timeline of what the events are, we can't use that timeline now as a way of pulling out information. Sometimes it worked depending on the types of information that were contained at least in the header of the, the document, sometimes it didn't. So it created these information management practices created a huge host of issues for us and trying also to navigate between different information silos. So you had the information management system, you had the shared drives, you had the emails, you had the data sets. So it made it really difficult to parse through all of that information to figure out what did we need to capture and transfer. So volume can greatly complicate the appraisal and selection process, along with the ability of archivists to, create, to carry out large scale evaluations of unstructured data. So when we did our tests at uh, National Archives UK, we ran the algorithms or the, the off the shelf uh, machine learning software on prem. So what that means is uh, on premise and it created a whole host of issues for us because we did not have a compute capacity to be able to go through large volumes of data. Our government departments were also in the same position that we were because they had outsourced their IT services to a third party who were asking ridiculous amounts of money, even just to implement the most basic of software. So we were running up against a catch 22. Um, there are issues if you're working at this from a government department point of view of trying to run uh, your machine learning technology in the cloud for security reasons and also depending on the types of information you're trying to look at and the types of information you're trying to evaluate so when i say security it's that we try to test this our uh, our machines that we tested three pieces of software out uh, we could not run it in the cloud because of the, of the security clearance of some of the records that we were trying to deal with. So it created a huge host of issues because we were asking departments in the UK to figure out what to keep and what to throw away. They didn't know the contents of the material and there was too much for them to look at. Then we had, they were asking them to figure out what was sensitive and what was not in the records. And again, because of volume and because of the sensitivity, we couldn't run it in an environment where we could make it make it the machine process fast enough uh, to be able to go through all of the information without it falling over and failing. 
So there were huge issues. And these are things you need to think about. If you're going to use this technology in archival practice, it's do you know the contents of your data? What is it you're trying to find out about your data? The amount of contextual work you have to do before you even start putting that data in the machine is absolutely vital. It's because if you don't understand what it is the question you're asking, you're, gonna, you're not gonna get the right outcome. And this creates a huge issue in terms of what becomes the archival record of the future. We could potentially skew the record of the future if we're not careful about how we use and how we, we interact with these types of, of technologies. So due to the amount of information that was required, we started to do, um, this is where we did sort of a second study to start examining off the shelf technologies that had machine learning capabilities for the purposes of assessing their viability in carrying out appraisal and selection. And that's the link there. And I am happy to give you this presentation after the fact so you can go have a look at the report. So what we discovered, uh, so we tested three types of technology to do appraisal and selection. And like I said, sensitivity review. So figuring out what should be open and what should be closed. In the lead up to using these machines, we out analyzed. So in the UK, anybody, any government department that wants to close their records has to provide a justification for the closure. Uh, and so we looked at the closure applications to uh, what the Lord Chancellor's Advisory Committee is what it's called. What we found was that about 75% of the applications were coming through as around personal data and then 25% were things around national security, international relations, uh, much more meaty subjects. Um, and so what we, uh, what we decided to look at um, was essentially to try and use these machines to analyze for personal data. The reason we chose for the, on the sensitivity review point of view to analyze for personal data is that one by proportion of the amount of closure applications that we were getting and because the machines had a greater capability of identifying that material that information so this, when we talk about personal data we talk about names so entity extraction uh, natural language processing um, then we talked about you know uh, as, uh, social insurance numbers uh, or any type of identific number identification that was regularly expressed, that's easy for a machine to do generally. As long, but again, it required training. We had to mark up the data set before we put it in. So that required all the upfront work by us and the government departments and departments are normally not happy to do this type of upfront work because it requires a huge amount of investment because you have to mark up the data set first and then you got to train the machine and then you got to make sure the machine is actually properly identifying the information uh, in the in in the data. So you train the machine and then you bring in another set of data and then you put it in and then you assess the precision and recall. So you assess how accurate the, the results are. Um, so this is not for the faint of heart uh, and you really do need to really properly plan the process. So what we found the machines do well, like I said, was regular ex uh, expressions, Boolean keyword search, and they can process at scale, provided you've got it in the right environment. What these machines do not do well at all. They do not understand and cannot infer context. I want to be clear about this. When we were looking at things around national security and international relations, the machine really couldn't distinguish with a level of accuracy and a level of, um, a level of precision and recall that we felt comfortable with. It was actually almost a null, percent, a null return. Um, and in, when I say no return, it's, it was at 50, 40, 50%. And so that's not good enough if you're going to use these machines uh, for that type of work. It means that it's, it's not working. And it's because context of information when you're doing these types of assessments is so incredibly important. Because a word or a sentence said in one document can be not sensitive, and a word in a sentence in another document can be sensitive. Same word, same documents, but the context around it becomes important. There's a lot of companies that were saying, if, we, if you do you know, sentiment analysis, you'll be able to find this information. No, because if I'm looking at a, a dispatch from an embassy, they could be saying uh, information because they were trying to argue that if it's negative sentiment, that it's sensitive. It's not the case at all. It could be just regular sentiment. Like it, there's nothing negative about it, but it's still sensitive. So there were a lot of sort of, not quite snake oil salesmen, but there was a lot of, I think, over-promising about what these 
the off the shelf technologies can do in terms of identifying sensitivity and in terms also of identifying, um, I would say, information that is uh, that for appraisal and selection. It is a balance. The tools are great when you, you have sort of regular sets of information uh, or regularized information that it can process at scale. Uh, but there's a point where the human needs to come in. And these are things around context. These are things around handwriting analysis, like I said, uh, or, under, or understanding the context of a record, understanding the context of information, and then making that decision. Machines, as I said earlier, do not do multivariable assessment very well. You know, and especially off the shelf software. So to be, to be cognizant of when you engage with these software. And again, you know, Boolean and keyword searches, it has its limitations too. So, you know, if you're trying to, and you have to understand the context of the records, because if you don't understand the context of the records, you don't understand the content of what it is you're appraising and selecting, you could either get too many results, not enough results. Uh, so you have to be really, really up to up to snuff about what it is that the questions you're asking the types of records you're dealing with um, and when you're going to have to get the human to intervene so you, you just need to be au okay fait with that before you actually start using the machine so this is an example of um, a, a visualization it's a date plot uh, and it's looking at types of documents containers presentations etc um, and so I use this as an example to say, uh, so they're, they're looking at the size of the item. Well, I can tell you that there could be material in there from 1995, but you have to remember that material from 1995, 1996, they're, they're, they're incredibly, incredibly small. So if you're using this type of a visualization, and these are visualizations that the machines generate, um, you have to be careful with this and you have to know the right questions to ask to to the service provider because you know and especially if and you also have to understand the date range of the data that you're interrogating because if there's material from 1995 there and you're trying to make an appraisal and selection decision you're saying well anything from 2005 onwards then that's what we'll analyze but you're potentially missing information from 1995 to 2003 because it's too small it's too small for the machine to analyze. So sometimes you got to cut up your data, depending on what it is that you're doing and depending it is how you're appraising and selecting. So it's something to be really mindful of uh, because a lot of organizations we were working with in, in, in UK government, there's like, oh, we'll just do appraisal and selection using, using file size. I said, whoa, stop. And I said, it, what's your date range here? And what is it that you're, what is it that you're analyzing? And then let's have a discussion about whether or not the file size is an appropriate measure for, say, for an appraisal and selection decision. Because formats have changed. The volume of formats have, changed, have gone up with the decrease in storage. Like there's a whole host of issues that we need to take into account when we look at this. Also, for example, if I'm saying, well, there should be material in 1995 in here and I'm not seeing it, but I'm seeing a spike in 2005, then there are questions as archivists we need to ask about, well, is there something it manifest that happened in 2005 that you can tell me about because it impact our appraisal and selection decision. Also, when you're working with these types of, of platforms and when you're working with these types of tools, so you see at the bottom it says document, container, presentation, image, unrecognized. Well, what's a container? What does that mean? Because that's going to impact your appraisal and selection decision. What's unrecognized? Because there, are record, there could be records in there that are actually really important, but that the, the system is only trained to recognize certain file formats. There are very few systems that can recognize the plethora of file formats that say uh, an interrogation system like DROID, Digital Object Record Identifier, which is used in National Archives, can identify. So there are limits as to the types of file formats some of these systems can, uh, can interrogate or return and identify. So again, you see over at the far end, there's a brown, th uh, brown symbol that says other document. Well, what is other document? Again, all of these things will impact your appraisal and selection decision. And so you need to be cognizant of how these machines are, are interrogating the data. Another thing to be mindful of that some of the systems will often uh, will often market to archivists and others. Oftentimes, uh, we looked primarily at the e-discovery market because that's where a lot of the machine learning was sitting when we were doing our tests. Uh, they offer clustering. 
So they'll offer like a categorization or clustering of concepts. And often it's done in an unsupervised fashion. And I was always really um, wary of, of using that as an appraisal and selection technique. I think what it can do is it can give you a good understanding potentially of the contents of the records to then do a more sustained search or a more sustained training of the system so that you get a more accurate result. Um, but I was always a bit weary, wary, sorry, about what it is they were returning because I wasn't entirely clear because the algorithms are proprietary. So you have to remember with commercial service providers, these algorithms, they own it. That's their copyright. That's their IP. They are not willing to let you look under the hood. So it creates an, a number of issues when you want to interrogate or we want to understand the precision and recall that you are getting based on the base information that you are feeding into the algorithm. So it's something that you need to be mindful of when you are engaging or working with a third party commercial software provider. You also need to be mindful that when you are working with these third party software providers, especially in e-discovery, these algorithms were trained for legal, uh, legal discovery. And in legal discovery, it's like the minimum amount that you need uh, according sometimes to a preset uh, search string that is given or approved by a court. Uh, and so it's the minimum amount that is necessary for legal proceeding. In archives, we have a much more, a much broader and a much more all encompassing need to capture as much as possible. Uh, and so we need a certain level and we also need to take into account the accountability on, on our end for using these types of technologies in the work that we do. So uh, we, when we use clustering, I think it's a tool. It's a tool to help us understand what's in the records, but I would not use this to make an appraisal and selection decision unless you have a level of comfort with the precision and recall that's coming back from the system based on the training that you've done. So the problems and limits that we encountered during the testing, so really a lack of understanding regarding the content and the context of creation of the, of the data that we were analyzing uh, that was held in government departments. Corruption or alteration of the metadata. Um, so because of migrations, the metadata changed. Uh, we had a lot of really unmeaningful file titles, which made it really difficult to um, make an appraisal decision just on the file title. Difficulty in understanding the visualizations generated by the machines. So this for me was really about different, uh, different off the shelf commercial software, defined different, uh, defined formats differently or define containers or packages differently. So you have to be really, really careful about what is unrecognized for X product or what is unrecognized for Y product. And what does that mean then? And do I actually, do I need to look at this? Uh, how do I unpack some of the, uh, some of the terminology? And also understanding how did the machine get to that point based on the training data that I've put into this. Um, understanding regarding the reliability of the results and the acceptable level of risk. So I, because these are black boxes, because these are commercial off the shelf technologies, we cannot necessarily go in, crack the code, pull the code out and then reach and then modify the code so that we can control the precision and recall. There was a limited amount that we could do in terms of understanding how the algorithm was processing the information to get to the endpoint. There was also a question uh, on our end of what is acceptable risk. So we as a community need to understand that we will never get it 100%. There was never such 100% precision recall. There was always a level of risk that we will potentially lose or not lose, that we will potentially omit material that somehow uh, will not fall into the parameters of how we've trained the algorithms or how we design the search parameters. And we need to accept that that's gonna happen. We need to accept that algorithms are not going to uh, are not going to find every single instance of what we are looking for. And so what does that mean for us? And what does that mean when we apply these machines? And what does that mean for archival accountability in this context? So there, there's, there's a whole host of questions, particularly as a profession. We have not been very good at exposing, I would argue, our practice around appraisal and selection. And these machines really do require us a level of rigor, a level of accountability, and a level of transparency around how we are arriving at the, what I consider the archival record of the future. We also need to be mindful that we have to retrain these algorithms every single time we use them. Archival records change, 
And so the parameters of the search, the parameters of retrieval will change as well. And that means that we essentially is, uh, we have to train the system every single time we want to use it for appraisal and selection. And a lot of times that we want to use it for sensitivity review as well. So um, it is, and so when I see people trying to identify what they call classifiers for things like sensitivity review, I have questions about how long that's actually going to be useful for. Uh, because, you know, it, it, some of these sensitivities are time sensitive, some of them uh, are, are context sensitive, uh, and also for appraisal and selection, events change, you know, uh, especially if we can't rely any further on the date, uh, you know, every, you know, would I have known uh, five years ago that I would be looking for COVID, you know, when I eventually come to the point where material related to the pandemic is transferred, you know, I, I, this is what I will be looking for. But would I have thought to, to train the machine to look for it five years before? No. So it, it's an iterative process and it's not static uh, in terms of how we do our appraisal and selection process using these machines. We had to deal with a lot of distrust in technology and the results that were generated by the system. Um, so when I talk about this, it was really that the paper process was seen in government as the gold standard. Um, paper was never perfect. The issue with paper is that it's just not discoverable. The issues are not discoverable. Uh, and so we have to balance the strengths of the technology with the human. And we need to know at what point the human needs to intervene. Uh, when the human's ca capacity for multivariable assessment becomes important. Um, it does take a significant amount of time to train the system. And our departments especially wanted something much more automated, almost unsupervised. But like I said, you know, uh, unsupervised, it has a set of training data behind it. It's just that we weren't involved in training the algorithm. Um, and I think it, it presents uh, huge, huge problems because people think algorithm, people think that, well, you can, it's just, you can just do whatever you want with it and you'll just get a, a result and it'll be accurate. And that's not the case at all. So in terms of uh, the impact uh, on our profession, so automation is really no longer a choice. It's a necessity. However, that does not mean that the human or archivist is irrelevant in the process. Uh, not at all. Like these machines are not silver bullets. As I said from the beginning, you know, they, are, they cannot do multivariable assessment. They can only assess what you give it to assess. It can't make a somehow pull, a, pull data from somewhere else by magic and, and, make it, and make some decision that you weren't expecting. It can only make a decision based on the information you put into it. Um, and so that is where still the archivist needs to intervene to say, well, this isn't, I need to actually look at some of parts of the data more in greater detail. So when I was at National Archives, we developed what I call the funnel technique, because what we found doing our appraisal and selection in uh, using these machines was that about 50% of the data was duplicate. So that's a huge amount. I think you need to distinguish between meaningful and unmeaningful duplication. And when I say that, I mean, you know, if you've got five of the same uh, five, five of the same presentations in a file, you don't need those five presentations, you might need one. But if you've got, uh, uh, you know, one presentation in this file and one presentation in, an, in another file elsewhere in the, in the system, they may be informing the records around it. And so at that point, you would want to capture it. The issue, though, with off the shelf commercial software is they don't often make that distinction about meaningful or unmeaningful duplication. What they're simply going to say is you've got it. You've got an exact bit for bit duplicate. So it's just something that, again, that requires a, a, a human to go in and look at. That is a lot of work, though. Do not think that simply because you use artificial intelligence that this, in, at least for appraisal and selection, that this is somehow going to limit the amount of manual intervention you may still need to do. It, there may still be quite a bit. So whilst we reduced the, the funnel by about half, uh, and then we, then we went into what we called sensitivity review, where we, we did what we called the bucket approach. So we had, we took that, we took the 75% um, related to personal data. We put that in there and we let the machine take care of that. And we, there was, you know, there was still risk and the machine's not gonna get it all right. Uh, but we felt that that was an acceptable risk to take. And then we actually had humans do the, ne the next 25%. And, 
and look at things like national security, international relations, to then come up with, at the end of the process, the records that would be transferred ostensibly to National Archives. We were monitoring this process very, very quickly, most of, not very quickly, very precisely. Most of our departments still, because they had such small sets of data, because we were only really assessing materials from, I'd say, 1995 to 2000, 2001. So the data sets themselves were really, really small. Um, and so a lot of our departments did double check. So although the machine went through it, they double checked everything. Um, and our research, at least for when we were looking at how well the machines uh, did on personal data interrogation, in the, in the literature was saying we were, they were getting results of about 90 to 95%, which is actually pretty good. But it took, again, it takes time to train the, the machine to get it to that level of accuracy. A lot of our departments didn't have the resource or the time to be able to invest in that. Uh, and that's a huge investment uh, that any archives that wants to use this will have to, to, to put in. Uh, and then, so it's just something to be mindful of. Um, I think the challenge with automating appraisal and selection along with sensitivity review is how do you measure accuracy? What does good enough look like here? Um, and what are the risks? And what is an acceptable risk appetite? Like I said, it's not going to be perfect, but then what are you willing to take on as an institution, as an organization? Um, and, and what is acceptable and how do you mitigate that? You know, it's like I said, it's not going to be 100%. These machines cannot do everything. Uh, another question is how do we determine what might be missing? Again, that comes into your, to your sort of risk appetite. Are you happy with the precision and recall? Um, I think you need to consider though, you know, when we talk about bias uh, in record and the use of artificial intelligence, you know, there's a, there's a level here that we have to accept that the record is biased. The record will represent a specific point of view at a specific time. Um, and as archivists, we just need to be mindful of that and that it may, it may potentially skew the results. Um, and there's questions of, is that okay? If it skews the results. Um, and if not okay, then how do you compensate? And like I said earlier, how can we account be accountable for the decisions we make based on machine outputs? How do we equally hold the machine to account? There's a whole issue around transparency and accountability of or govern, uh, algorithmic accountability. How do we compensate for changes in the digital record over time? And how do we retune the algorithm? Like I said, from my perspective and based on my experience, I think we need to retune it ev for every single time if we're gonna do appraisal and selection for it. Sensitivity review, you know, it depends, it would depend on the legislation and how the legislation changed with regard to personal data and what constitutes personal data. Um, for, and the same for, you know, international relations or national security. But if we've got a human doing that, then, you know, that, that's a human judgment. It's not to say human judgment is, is incredibly accurate, but, uh, or accurate all of the time, but um, the context specific uh, sensitivities need to be assessed by a human. And, you know, I think we need to be, we need to be cognizant that if we are dealing with commercial off the shelf software, that we're dealing with black boxes. And so we risk, and we need to acknowledge this, we risk biasing the historical record and by proxy history and our collective memory. So we need to be careful about how we use these technologies moving forward and how we engage intelligently with these technologies and what are the right questions to ask and how do we approach it and how do we prepare for using these technologies in our processes? Because I don't think it's a question of if for us, it's a question of when. Like I said, automation is no longer a choice. So picking up a question around uh, ethics and algorithmic accountability. So I feel strongly that archival codes of ethics need to be studied and revised, uh, not only in terms of our practice as archivists using these technologies, but I would say our, how do we act in an ethical manner or how do we, uh, what is our ethical stance in, in a government setting or an institutional setting where potentially we may run up against what we feel is perhaps unethical uses of these technologies. I still think we're lacking the proper competencies and skills to work with these technologies. I don't think, again, I don't think it's insurmountable. I think it's about taking the time to educate yourself. It's about taking the time to do small tests. So the tests we did at National Archives UK were really, really small data sets, but we learned so much just from doing, using small data sets in terms of you know, uh, issues around keyword searching, issues around the dates, issues around 
uh, file format and the way that machines uh, interpreted the information. I think, you know, there is already a lot of work happening around algorithmic accountability and transparency. So I feel strongly that corporations and businesses, as well as government, need to be accountable for how their machines arrive at a result, or they must disclose the workings of their algorithms. So uh, there is the Declaration of Algorithmic Transparency from the Association of Computer Computing Machinery. There's the partnership with AI, partnership between Google, Microsoft, IBM, Facebook to promote AI for a social good. I'm slightly resident, uh, reticent on that particular partnership. I find it difficult um, when large corporations like Google, Microsoft, IBM, and Facebook are there to promote AI for social good when they have a commercial gain potentially um, by using these technologies. There is also the Montreal Declaration, which is a more recent declaration on the, re, uh, on the use of responsible AI. Uh, and then also there are the EU regulations and principles around AI usage uh, around, and uh, personal privacy. So there's a lot emerging. I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, both in terms of uh, legal, uh, both in terms of law, and I think in terms of jurisprudence. I don't think it's caught up. It's kind of left us in a bit of a, of a void, I would say. And I think some of the codes of ethics as well, in, archival codes of ethics, in terms of giving us guidance on how to use these technologies. Um, and how to properly engage with them. Um, and Thea, I, yeah. um, I just wanted to let ten you know we have 10 minutes until um, we get to the 30 minute marker. <laughs> so, almost done. <laughs> so I'm moving now into making records accessible and, read, uh, and readable for research. So two issues for the archival community to consider uh, is the impact of researchers trying to mine archival data digitize, and digitization of historical data and information. So researchers are starting to use data mining techniques to parse through large uh, volumes of data. So researchers, I know Google Ngram is not something necessarily want to hold up, but it is a parsing technology uh, that some researchers have used uh, to mine literature to trace things like stereotypes in literature. And there are also many other tools, sometimes bespoke tools that researchers are or will begin to use uh, in order to carry out their research. So there's questions for us as archivists about how much access we wish to allow researchers uh, around access to public records and data. So data mining, I mentioned earlier at the beginning, data mining and machine learning tools break down silos that are created by archival description. They can also reveal unknown connections that can become sensitive or problematic by virtue of the connections that they're making. So uh, the issue here comes back to the question of sensitivity review. A little bit. So it can surface uh, since, uh, information that wasn't properly reviewed by uh, and, and surface, therefore, uh, sensitive information. But also sitting in the, in the descriptive silos, information may be, may be public sitting in its descriptive silos. But the moment a machine breaks that down and starts to make connections, there may actually be sensitivities that surface. And so there's questions, I think, for us when we start talking about uh, Internet of Things, uh, networked archival description, uh, or even just breaking down the silos and letting a researcher parse through large amounts of our collections uh, down to sort of the, at the content of a record. What does this mean for us? And, and, and what are we willing to allow? And are there different levels of, of security that we may want to apply depending on the records? I don't know. These are questions. Um, again, it can surface things that were missed during sensitivity review. Also, once the data is mined and put in, uh, is put into a system outside the archives, what else can it can be combined to? So let's not get tunnel vision with AI. Uh, there is danger of focusing too much on the impact on our individual collections. But like I said, what about linked data? What about semantic data? What will this mean for archives uh, and opening up our collections? And it's not that I don't think we should, like I'm not saying don't open up our collections. I think we absolutely need to. But I think we need to be cognizant of the risks of, of interlinking our different connection, uh, collections. And like I said, potential issues that might surface, whether that's sensitivity, whether that's, you know, any, any type of, uh, uh, these types of risks that might come, come to mind. But it's something I don't know that we've really thought about. Um, and it, again, it's a question of, are we willing to accept that risk as well? We also need to consider the impact of future digitization. So the repurposing and reuse of archival records and data has had enormous value. And I think we sacrificed much 
uh, by digitization and allowing companies to digitize archival records and data in order that we can get a free copy. I think we need to be savvier about this. We hold vast, and I mean vast amounts of important data. And as much as we want to make it available, um, I think that uh, we need to be careful. There are a lot of companies that are beginning to realize the value of data held in historical records. Digitizing them and applying OCR as a me method of gaining access to large volumes of data to train algorithms. We need to be cognizant of that. What is free is not always free. We need to start asking ourselves, why is digitization free? Will this data be used to train an algorithm? And I need, I think, if we're especially for engaging with certain companies, that is a question we need to ask ourselves. What is the company's ethical stance around reuse of the data once they've got it? What happens to the data once the digitization is done? And will there be an impact on people's lives? So I'm going to give you a quick example. I know I have only have a few minutes left, but a quick example around paper digitization of paper death registrations. Um, so a lot of companies have digitized this information. We also know that there are algorithms out there that are, you know, uh, allowing and disallowing around um, insurance healthcare. Well, if we combine the, the information in death registrations, so that contain oftentimes uh, the cause of death, and we are start, we over time are able to link an individual, living individual such as myself, uh, with uh, the different causes of death within a family. And maybe those causes of death are actually sort of predominantly cardiac, for example. Then can healthcare or health insurance companies start to say, well, based on the preponderance of this particular medical condition that we are seeing based on the death records we have mined, and you have now applied for health insurance, we are now going to deny you coverage if you, if you try and claim against this particular health issue. This poses issues, but this is data that oftentimes archives have made freely available, have made available for digitization so that we can get a free copy. And I think we need to start really thinking about this, uh, I would argue, in a, wider, uh, in a wider sort of lens of the impact of AI. So in summary, so government use of artificial intelligence. So these are a lot of questions because um, there's a lot of thinking I think we still need to do as a, as a profession. So what role does the archives and information community have to play in this space? And do we have a role? I think we do. What skills do we have? Uh, what's, or do we need if we are to play a role? What is a record? How do we capture and preserve the record? Who are our partners and how do we begin to work with them? When we look at machine learning and artificial intelligence and archival practice, what is accuracy? What are risks that we are willing to accept? What's the risk appetite we have around accuracy? How can we ensure the accountability of the decisions we make based on machine learning and artificial intelligence processes? In terms of artificial intelligence, machine learning and research, how much access is too much access when machines are involved? Or is it okay just to let the machine parse through everything? What, is the, what are the right questions to ask when private companies offer us free digitization? And how do researchers want to use our records to carry out digital research? And what implications does this have for the archives? So just a quick parting thought, whether you're using an algorithm, artificial intelligence or machine learning, one thing is certain. If the data being used is flawed, then the insights and the information will be flawed. So at the end, I've got a reference for further readings, just uh, for information about the further readings. Um, I'm trying and presenting these readings a global picture of different points of view about the use of artificial intelligence. So I don't subscribe to any one of them, uh, but I, what I've tried to do is present different sides of the, of the spectrum regarding the use of AI. And so that's me, done. Thank you, Dr. Um, Sellis, for your um, wonderful presentation. Um, we have quite a few questions. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna try and get through as many of them as possible. Um, so the first one, uh, uh, one of the folks who listed said, how do the artificial intelligence help us in the appraisal and the disposal work? And what are the appropriate skills and knowledge of archivists will be necessary to work together in artificial intelligence? So I think uh, the use of AI for artificial intelligence is really useful, particularly when you're dealing with born digital, simply because of the, the magnitude of the data that you're, we're gonna be dealing with, and also because of the, of the variety of file formats. And also AI enables you, especially if you have silos, to break down 
It, let, it allows you to parse off or parse through all of those silos. So, the, and as we get into greater and greater volumes of data, that is where it also is going to become incredibly important. I think um, it's also how we understand how the machine, like I said earlier, how is the machine processing the information? How is the machine then rendering that information for us to look at it at visualization? And so what do we need to be mindful of and what questions do we need to, to think about asking? I think in terms of skills, it's uh, some of it, it, I would argue, is understanding, having a basic understanding of st statistics is really, really helpful. Um, and like I said, there are courses on Coursera, there are free courses, excellent courses, and there are also very uh, inexpensive paid for courses in um, in these types of platforms, Skillshare, Coursera, that you can you can go to, you can learn, and you've got then a, at least a basic set of information that you can then use to think about how the machine is doing the work. We need to remember though that because we're not the designers in the process, we're taking machine, we're taking off-the-shelf commercial software. So our ability to truly understand precision and recall is, I, I would say, is is kind of impacted, um, and so uh, it's. It, but having that ability to understand a little bit how the machine is, is processing really comes from, I would say, the statistical analysis. Data science courses, there's a lot of them out there that I think are also really helpful. But I would say start with the basic stats course and then work your way up. Um, and like I said, there's lots of free courses out there. I know the British Library actually is offering training around programming for information professionals. So having a basic understanding of pro programming is really, really helpful. Um, but yeah, I, we don't have to be experts. We just need to get a basic understanding of what that machine is doing. Yes. Thank you for answering that question. So our next one, um, uh, one of our guests is wondering, are there any differences between data in general term and data in our archival term? And he said, thank you. Uh, I don't think so. I think when I, and the reason I use the term data is because of the communities and the partners I try and work with. They don't understand what an archive, what a, not an archive, well, they don't understand what an archive is most of the time, but they don't understand what a record is. We have a very specific definition of what a record is. Whereas when I'm working with data scientists, when I'm working with IT people, when I'm, even when I'm working with decision makers, they get what data is. And they often define unstructured records which are what we call records and, and data, which we also call records as, as data. So for me, there's, I, I make, I call it data simply because that's how the community that controls the discussion around this uh, 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 sort of references what we call records. So it's more because I need to, I need the in with that community. And so I've also used it in my presentations because I use this presentation a lot in different contexts. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Um, our next question. How does neural network function in artificial intelligence? So neural networks, um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on neural networks, but it's really, it, the, uh, as I understand it, it's the different networks that have different pieces of information. Um, and then through the training of the neural network, begin to identify what is uh, what is essentially the precision and recall for what the output is. There's lots of information. I, I may not have explained it very well, but there's lots of information online on what neural networks do. So I would suggest go online and have a look because um, I don't think my definition is very good. <laughs> <laughs> and complex. Okay, so the next question is uh, two parts. Um, what skills will be required once a AI is fully implemented specifically for archivists? Mm -hmm. Do we need to educate them um, as this might affect, uh, might have effects on their behavior? And then the second portion of the question is, how long do you think it'll take us to keep the learning process for the machines till we reach to the minimal number of errors? Well, I think, uh, so on the first one, I think, the skills for me to say when uh, to be able to look into the future and what I think the skills would be when AI is fully implemented in, in the majority of archival institutions, I think it will change. So what I'm advocating now are the skills that we need to start engaging. So it's around, you know, I think, like I said, the basic statistics, uh, doing, you know, some basic data, um, data science courses that will help us. Mm. Um, I think, uh, 
What was the second half of the question? Sorry. That's okay. Let me go back. Yeah. It was multiple parts. Yeah. Oh, let's see. I had resolved that one. Let's see if I can refind it again. I'm going to move to the sure. next question and sure. then I'll see if I can go back and track. Okay, no worries. <laughs> I have it, Azure, if you, oh, you do. would like okay. it. This is Krista. Um, the second part is how long do you think it will take us to keep the learning processes for the machines um, till we reach a minimal number of errors? So, yeah. I think, you know, it depends on the, on the, so I think there's two parts to that. So one is it depends on the, the size of the data set that you're working with. And it depends on the questions that you're trying, that, that you're asking the machine to, to answer for you. Um, and it, the process is iterative, like I said, and also it will be dependent upon each of the new data sets that you put in. Like I said, appraisal and selection, it, it's, it's not linear like you would necessarily expect when you're engaging with certain AI because AI often is given one question and then that's the output and then you just keep putting the data in to get to improve this, the output to the question. Our questions in, our, in appraisal and selection vary it based on the the different records that we're dealing with and so there's it's it's difficult to say what is the optimal uh precision of recall because it will depend on the each of those different sets of records that we're working with so the next question that um one of the participants asked, if we have machine learning and EDRMs, do we need to, do we need um, retention periods scheduled? Depends on what the machine is being asked to do. You know, mm -hmm. I think it, it's, you know, what if, are we saying to the machine, um, I need you to identify X of these types of records uh, to destroy. But the problem is if we're saying it has to be in this form, like if the records have to be in a certain format, the format changes or the, the form that the records have change. So I think it, it depends on, uh, it depends on how the, the parameters are defined. Um, and it is not static. Like that's the thing is like none of this process is static, whether that's, from an EDRM perspective or whether that's from an AI perspective. Um, there may, because laws change, classes of records vary, functions move. So it depends on the context, I would say. Um, and it depends on uh, uh, the types of information you got in your system that you can train the AI to, uh, that you want the AI to parse through. Because if you've already scheduled the information, then why would, you know, my question would be, why do you feel you need artificial intelligence if you've already set the retention rules within the system? Like what is the, what's, what's the underlying issue that you're trying to solve by applying artificial intelligence in an EDRM? Okay. So the next question is how many activists have sufficient understanding of AI to serve as advisor for ethical issues or for what to keep? I would say, not, not huge numbers. I think it's, we're just starting to use it now. I will be interested to see in the Congress in Abu Dhabi next year, how many papers come up around the use of artificial intelligence in archives. I think it's early days, but I would rather we get ahead of this curve now while it's early days and start asking ourselves the questions and start having these conversations than waiting until something serious happens. Yeah. All right. So the next one is, does archive, does archive infrastructure prepare to document uh, and preserve all processes? And what kind of archive should we do? Okay, I think there's a typo here. So what kind of archive should do that? National Institute, for example. I think, you know, it comes back to the infrastructure question. Um, that and that's not an easy, it's not a, it's, it's not an easy, you know, question, it's not an easy situation to resolve because these are, like I said, these are huge volumes of data um, and you would need data centers to, to preserve this. And so at this point, um, I'm not aware of any archives that has acquired AI. 
Um, and so I wouldn't be able, I think, really to answer that question uh, with a level of accuracy, because I would just be guessing at this point about what I think that might look like. Um, and I think, you know, do there's questions around, do we, do we look at decentralized archiving? Does every institution need to have uh, a digital repository? Mm -hmm. uh, and are there better ways that we can centralize um, our services and our storage so that we can do this type of preservation? Uh, and maybe we have other allies that we have to work with in this space too. Mm -hmm. Got you. So the next one is, um... So what, okay, so what you're saying is that we as archivists have to advise governmental bodies or other organizations in how data structure combine and process? I think, and, and then, sorry, sorry. And then you say, so that puts us on the chair of policymakers and asks for detailed knowledge about and experience with the policy subjects you're advising. Isn't this conflicting with our goal to establish an objective documentation of the follow processes? And can we not better focus on advising how people document their choices made in structuring, combining and processing data? I think they are kind of three questions. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try and take it at, at a high level. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I worked uh, in UK government, it was always something that was in the back of my mind and that we discussed when I was with my government departments. Like I said, I am simply there to say, this is potentially an issue you're gonna to wanna to think about. And these are potentially some of the implications you're gonna to wanna to think about. What the government department chose to do at that point, that was on them. Um, and so I think I agree that what we're, our main role is, is to ensure the integrity and the documentation of the process. But I think we're, I don't think it's outside of our realm of, of responsibility to say, you know, we have a knowledge about the technology that the policy the policy this person will not have and the implications of using experimental technology with the most vulnerable in society coming back to the handwriting analysis where I think this really flagged up this this particular question so my issue is like there's nothing lost in us just saying you may want to be mindful of this and there are serious issues of using experimental technology in, in doing policy decision. They may tell us to go for a walk, but at that point then my role as an archivist is to document and is to ensure that the, they document their process, they document their procedures, that we have the data set, we have the algorithm, because potentially it'll come back to haunt them. And at that point, all I do is just go, well, there's the data and that's what we documented and that's what you used and that's how you got to your decision. How, how you are held accountable or how, what, how the government chooses to interrogate that after the fact, that's on you. All right, thank you. Next question is how we may document preserve algorithm when government use them from private vendors, NDA, uh, intellectual property issues, et cetera. And I think that's the problem. This is the issue I'm seeing right now with a lot of the public pri private partnerships that are emerging in government. Like I said in the beginning, I understand that government does not have the resources to do everything. I understand the value in having competition in having different working with different um, uh, private sector providers. But what this then does is that it creates potentially black boxes where we as citizens cannot access. I think the way around that one, if for governments is to build into their contracts with these companies that they must uh, give a level of, uh, of accountability for the algorithm. It still doesn't subvert the issue around the intellectual property. And I think it's, for me, it's, it's, a real, it's a real concern around using these types of black boxes in policy, because as archivists, we can never capture that because it's covered under intellectual property, because it belongs to a third party service provider. And so at that point, it's how, what, how do we document that process without a key piece of evidence, which is the algorithm. And that's where I think the, in the, uh, when we we're talking about ethics and algorithmic accountability and legal, the sort of dearth of le uh, legal cases or precedent that we can reference, it, it's, it's a danger. It's a danger for citizens. And I feel it's a danger for government. There is no easy answer there, but it's something we need to be mindful of. So the next one would be um, how archivists could advise their scientists when they do not well understand scripts and algorithm. How could it? 
So I think you don't necessarily need to have a detailed understanding of scripts and algorithm. What you do need to have an understanding of is how they're documenting that process. And it's, you know, and I, maybe, maybe I'm coming at this from, um, you know, a, 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 a position where I've been able to access a lot of education uh, online and, and, you know, maybe that's not always possible. Um, but you know, I, I don't think it's outside the realms of possibility. The internet is a, is a wonderful thing. And you can learn a lot on the internet about codes and algorithms. I think it's making sure that you go into the right sites that are trustworthy sites that are reliable and, and have authority and integrity. But um, I would say that really the main key is understanding the process, understanding how they arrive at what they consider the final, final decision, the final output. Um, and then documenting that. You don't necessarily need to understand how they're changing the actual script or code. What you need to make sure is that you have the system that is documenting all that. And there are systems out there that do that for researchers. So it's not unheard of. And that you just make sure that you've got that piece of information and that you can take that into the archives and you can ingest it. There's a whole issue about rendering. How do you render artificial intelligence for, you know, you know, regression modeling or for reuse by researchers? That's a whole nother kettle of fish I didn't even touch on. But it's not, I don't think you need to be a, an advanced programmer for this. What you need to, you need to grasp is what is the process and what needs to exist for the integrity of it. So next question, how can we guarantee AI records can be read in the next 200 years? Oh, we need to delete that one. You just answered that one. Um, are governments allowed to take decisions um, concerning citizens using AI technologies? I thought it was forbidden, e.g. by GDPR. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, that's the General Data Protection Regulation. So that's the privacy legislation in the EU. Uh, I don't think it's illegal at all. I think they can do it and they have done it. And hmm. um, I think the issue is around the correction of the, if I'm not mistaken, around GDPR, it's around the correction of the data that may be used to influence a decision that has an impact on you. You have a right to correct that, but uh, it, it can be used and is used in government decision making. Next question. With my experience in intergovernmental organizations, archivists need to upgrade their skills and get the appropriate IT skills. With the digital information and AI, there's a risk um, archivists of today won't be able to function in a couple of years. The big question is, what is ICA doing to ensure the upgrade in archival education in order to incorporate these current challenges? I think, uh, so we're offering, we're starting, uh, we're offering a course coming in the fall around managing digital archives. So in that we're offering at least some basic tools and tips and well, not basic, it's a whole, it's a whole structured course that was developed by two professionals around how to set up your digital archives, how to maintain your digital archives and um, with different modules. So we're starting. I think if we're talking about the skills uh, needed to do the work that I'm talking about, um, I think, you know, there's a conversation with the community at large first about what we think those skills look like. I know there's, of course, there's archival programs around the world around computational archival um, studies that are coming up. Um, so I think we would have to look there. I think that we can, I, I don't want to be duplicating as ICA courses or resources that are available elsewhere. Um, I think there is a question for us about how we look at what the implications are from an educational point of view, building on what already exists. Uh, and then, you know, is it up to us to create new tech, uh, new training, or is it up to us to sort of start formulating what the competencies we feel are, because the competencies will change. We're still early in this process. Um, and all the competencies I've acquired, I've acquired on my own time and on my own resource. So it doesn't necessarily mean that what I think right now is, is the whole picture. So I think there's a conversation about what we think this looks like from an educational point of view before ICA starts saying we need to do X, Y, and Z. So there's a conversation first, and then I think we can start looking at our partners so that we can start pointing and saying, well, if you're looking for this skill, go here. If you're looking for that skill, go there. Because I don't think we need to duplicate what already exists. So like I said, conversation still needs to happen, but I take the point. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> So next uh, participant said, um, the code is fixed for one agency or could use with others. I'm not sure what the context in that one is. Not clear okay. either. They can go back and add in the chat or revise it. Maybe we can get back to that one. Okay. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, what do you mean by saying that unstructured data is not yet an archive or maybe even a record? No, I didn't say that. No, unstructured data is just Word documents. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when I say, when I use the word unstructured data, I just mean, as I said earlier, it's just a way to, to speak to different communities about what it is that we hold, but I never said that it wasn't a record. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. No, it's fine. <laughs> Has the Na National Archives study about AI and machine learning in archives been applied also to web archiving processes, specifically in creating indexes and tools for access? That I don't know. So I don't know what's happened with the research since I've left. So I've been out of the National Archives UK now for two and a half years. I know they're working. They're still working on the topic, but I don't know what they've uh, what they have applied uh, uh the, their research or what the focus of their research has been so i would suggest going on national archives uk website uh looking at their blog that's normally where they talk about some of the emerging research that they're doing and seeing um how they've re-examined uh, the use of ai and archival practice and whether they've looked at it from a web archiving perspective Next question. Has anyone heard of or know of any examples of using AI to automate? Uh, more to my question. Okay. Um, AI to automate or simplify the filing process, i.e. to encourage users to file their records in the official information management system. Um, I have seen examples that I wouldn't say they were AI, but they were basic routing uh, scripts to so that when people filed information using certain metadata tags, it actually just linked the pushed the material out into the file into a specific file. So what the user saw was a very simplified sort of almost Google search feature. And so they could type in the information and provided they had the right uh, keywords and metadata, they could pull the record back up. Um, and when they were creating the record, it was often the keyword, depending on, I can't remember all the, all the parameters of it, but it depended on um, how they, they, what file they sometimes associated the record to, and it would just automatically put the file in there. So they didn't have to save it directly into the file. So there are, there are situations where I've seen that, and absolutely it could help with uh, routing user information. But again, I think you need to be careful because you'll have to retrain the algorithm at some point because the way you know, functions change, uh, stuff changes, and uh, the way information is created is changes. So you have to make sure that you know when your, your algorithm needs to be retuned so that it's routing the information in the appropriate areas. I think we'll do, I think, a couple more questions. Okay. I think the next one has multiple parts. Um, this a participant wants to know, would you be able to share some information about practices in the UK National Archives and government on managing structured data as records? How does um, UK identify, capture, manage, and apply retention and disposition to data, um, both transactional applications and analytical ones? Um, again, I've been away for two and a half years. So my first recommendation would be to check the UK National Archives website to see if they have updated information on the identification of data sets um, as records. Uh, we were acquiring a few data sets uh, when, right before I left at National Archives UK. Um, and I think we were trying to unpack the preservation process. So we were looking at CIARD, which was developed by the Swiss National Archives. Um, which looked at the uh, packaging up and preservation of um, data sets. In terms of identification of data sets, I think we were primarily looking at it, at least when I left, from the point of view of function and what was the function and the use of the data set and what decisions were uh, what decisions was it, was it influencing and were these substantive decisions and so therefore how do we capture it. Um, and I think too, it, it's sort of try, it's sort of looking at what previous information may, we might have captured, say it was case files, 
that have since been transformed into data sets and then identifying those and making sure that, that we were able to bring those in. But I, I don't know if they've developed a more um, a, a sort of firm policy on that and how they're approaching data set capture and, and, and preservation. So check the website is the best advice I can give, I'm afraid. Thank you. So next question, um, Lisa, thank you so much for our informative presentation. In your opinion, can you, um, can you appraise it says, um, they're wondering about the appraisal and selection process without okay. any human particip participation. Um, can it be adequate? And how can AI determine, for example, historical and cultural value of a record during this process? Is it really possible concerning AI's inability to process multivariable assessment? No, it can't. That's where the human comes into play. And sorry, is there, is there more question oh, to that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then can you recommend any articles, books concerning use of AI cloud service for records specialists who are unfamiliar with AI and its possibilities? So I'm working with researchers right now um, that are trying to find a publisher for a book on archives and AI and access. Mm -hmm. So that's one that I'm aware of. Um, The other books I would point you to would be more general reading, sort of more available presentation I have. In terms of specific articles looking at AI, I have reviewed a few for a couple journals, but I haven't seen any recently. So I'm afraid I'm not very helpful on that point. But I would suggest um, if you're looking for reports, the National Archives UK is the report we did. It's been, it's been out of date now. We did it in 2015, it's five years old. So, you know, it needs some updating. Um, it could be they have other reports that they've published since then, but that's the one that I'm aware of that I was involved in. Um, and, you know, I would say, if you're looking for general reading around AI, one I found interesting, it's a, it's a bit sort of dire, but interesting is Kathy O'Neill's book on weapons of math destruction. Because um, it kind of gives you a sense of some of the issues you need to think about and really help me sort of break down what I need to think about from an archives perspective uh, around what are the considerations and what are the things I, I need to be aware of when I'm trying to train data and what are the things I need to avoid or train, uh, I'm sorry, not train data. Um, thank you. So next question, what are um, your recommendations for a better preparation to handle AI ML and the logarithms in the field of archives. Sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> back. What are your recommendations for a better um, for better preparation to handle AI, ML, and the logarithms in the field of archives? So I think one is training. So which I talked about earlier. I think one is we have to just get our hands dirty. We just have to test out some technologies and you know get some small amounts of data that are manageable and that we can get a sense around the precision and recall to get a sense of how these machines work, um, to get a sense of you know how would what are the things what are the the constraints we need to be aware of when does the human need to get involved what are the things that the machine won't do for us uh, or that we just need to be extra vigilant about that the machine might say this is garbage but in reality is actually a record so i think it's just teaching ourselves and, and going out there and and, and training and, and working with the as my one of my colleagues said learning by doing yeah. <laughs> all right so uh we come uh, almost coming to the end of our you know assigned time that we have but i, I feel like we just need this last question and then uh, that the question was, what will a code of ethics for an archivist in this age, new age of AI we look like? And is it necessary our responsibilities that archivists to interrogate the, arch the, arch the algorithm in government decision making? Or is it a responsibility for all of us as citizens or public servants? I think it's, it's, it's a mix. It's a mix of um, as, as citizens, we need to hold government to account for the decisions that they're making and sort of for these types of partnerships that they're getting involved in, especially if they have, if they have an impact on our lives. But I think too, as archivists, um, we, we need to update our, our codes of ethics for the, for, to, to adapt to these new types of technologies. And it's, it's how do you make a code of ethics, um, how do you, 
I'm not finding the right words right now, but how do you stabilize it so you're not revising it every two years because there's a new piece of technology that's coming out um, while still being mindful that they will have an impact on the work that we do, on the advice that we give. And so, sorry, and, and, how, and how we manage that. Gotcha. I mean, we, we just, this was just kind of a wonderful conversation and we <laughs> come to the end and uh, I would say that there's going to be definitely a follow up because there's definitely kind of a, a great interest in this kind of, a, you know, a conversation, but also because people are asking, right, I'm going through the question, like how much penetration does AI have, have in, you know, archives in the developing world, people are asking a lot of questions, what skills? And thinking about just the scale, and one of the questions that you had, we had, and then you try to answer to was that the constant library, uh, library, constant library resources information, actually has a clear uh, constant libraries information resource, <laughs> right? Definitely, so has some, uh, provides also uh, some kind of training. So resources are out there, but as you say, it's just a time time for us to be able to you know yeah. train ourselves and you know be start practicing, definitely learning by doing. So with that said, I would say thank you to Dr. Andrea um, Antia. And then we have other sessions, we have other webinars that are coming and I want to say thank you to Kia for sponsoring through Kia, the Melon Foundation for sponsoring this uh, emerging technologies and big data and archives uh, webinar series. And uh, my name, Rebecca Reyek, I'm Rebecca Bayek, Dr. Rebecca Bayek. I'm actually a postdoc at the Schomburg Center. So I want to say thank you as well to the Schomburg Center for just providing me this opportunity to be able to do this kind of work as well. And then my other colleague, Azuri Stewart from uh, PhD as well, and then uh, from the New York University Library. So uh, with that said, we will say thank you to everybody. And then we hope that uh, we're going to definitely have a follow up. Again, we're, we think about the follow up, and no worries. All the questions are captured. <laughs> we have a video. The, the video recording are going to be uploaded in the, uh, the clear um, YouTube. And uh, with that said, we say thank you. Thank you a lot. And uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody.